Guys, if you haven't checked up on our social media recently, what have you been doing? I'm at Nick Hardwick, and Jamie is at Jamie.Hardwick. That's J-A-Y-M-E with a period and then Hardwick, which is not to be confused with the other Jamie Hardwick, who I tagged a little while ago on Instagram, and she notified me that uh, you may want to get this straight, bud. Your wife may be pissed at you. That earned me the Worst Husband of the Week award. Sorry, babe. Anyway, you guys know that Lose Like Alignment is going off. I'm sure you've seen some of the ads circulating. Hundreds of men now are losing staggering amounts of weight on a daily basis. It's been so awesome to see. And of course, I had no idea that life would turn into this for me or for us. I just had to get the information out of my head, share it with others, see if it could help people reclaim their lives. And lo and behold, it has. And I am just really grateful to be a part of this amazing team. And the most fulfilling thing for me and the program is the weekly interactions that we get through the accountability network. So sign up for that. It is awesome to get personal connections and have conversations and get to understand who people are, what their challenges are, and assist on a very personal basis on a weekly basis. So as this was all going on, we're getting crazy amounts of requests from the ladies wondering if this program is good for them too. And for me, I said, sure, yeah, it is. And But really since the beginning, I've tried to get Jamie to give my plan a try and she would try it for a day or two and then basically tell me it wasn't for her. And finally, listening to the request on social media and through email for a female version and then getting some feedback back from females who were actually in the program and taking that into account and then asking and not telling Jamie what can make this plan work for her and for other females, she went, took the parts from the men's program that she liked, modified it to accommodate the female body and your guys' individual preferences, and gave it a try. And I tread lightly saying this to her. Thankfully, she's not around right now. But it's been super cool watching her own this program. She has gained control back over the food, has reset her hunger cues, and has lost the weight she's been trying to lose really forever. I know. I Believe me, I don't think she has anything to lose either, but still, she's getting to a place where she feels great about her body, and that is important. In fact, I just get out of the bathroom, and she says, I've lost this weight, but Nick, I've lost an inch off of my waist. She's taken measurements. So we sent the adjustments back to our design team, and voila, the Lose Like a Lady program is born. We would love for you guys to join the team. If you want to know more, all food preferences and eating styles work within the framework we provide in both the men's and the women's program. We do provide body weight only workouts and daily activities known as every hour on the hour exercises, EHO. But guess what? As we tell everyone, the exercise is the least important component of the plan. It's not required to lose weight. If you don't want to exercise or you've got your own form of exercise that you would rather do, do that. We are never going to discourage that. This program will help you figure out what works best for you. You're going to learn appropriate caloric loads for the day and per meal. You're going to learn how to match your caloric intake with daily activity levels. You're going to break free from the having to eat a meal every three hour cycle. It really is an incredibly empowering experience. Also, the program helps build healthy self-care habits that make the program sustainable for life. And it's wonderful when you figure out that the more you take care of yourself, the healthier, the easier it is to make good choices when it comes to food, when it comes to exercise. And the best part about the program that a lot of people find is it's four weeks on and two weeks off of the plan. That is what we call a diet break. How many programs encourage you to not do the diet. We do that so you're going to build trust with yourself. You're going to take the skills you learned and you're going to put them to test in the real world. The whole process, it's incredibly empowering. When you reclaim your health, you really do reclaim your life. Join our teams. Sign up at hardwick.life. It's like hardwick.com but hardwick.life and use the code podcast20 for 20% off the order. And by the way, you can use that code forever on anything site-wide forever. And we want you to know that we're here for you. You can email me directly at nick at nickhardwick.com. I, I do. I get back to everybody. Try it. Try me. I'll get back to you. Uh, anything you have. Show recommendations, any questions, any support, any criticism. We're here for that. 
Throw everything my way. You need help modifying this program to suit your particular needs? All you got to do is ask. We've helped hundreds of people make this program work in their lives, and you can too. All right, guys, back to the show. Check it out. Hardwick.life, podcast 20 for 20% off, and we hope to see you on the network soon. Love you guys. Thank you. Hey guys, welcome into the Hardwick Life Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Hardwick. Got a great guest today. I went on his show recently and couldn't wait to talk to him a little bit more. Langston Moore is his name, actually. Once an athlete, now an artist, Langston Moore has thrived in his post-NFL playing career. Using the fundamental skills of reading, writing, and speaking, Langston served as the sideline reporter for the South Carolina Gamecocks IMG Network while also writing a weekly column for the Spurs and Feathers. Looking for a challenge, Langston teamed up with Preston Thorne to create the world's greatest Gamecock children's book ever. I can testify this is an awesome book, very inspiring. Actually, two books, Just a Chicken and its sequel, Just a Chicken Little. Great messages in those one. They've combined to sell over 30,000 plus books independently, relying on the same tenacity and toughness that led him to success in his seven-year NFL career. Langston and Preston have worked with over 200 plus schools, spreading their message to students, staff, and parents about going pro and reading. That's an awesome message. I love following them on Instagram. They get these kids all riled up. It's super cool. Langston and Preston have also created their company, Athletes an artist. a and it's a platform that features the latest content Langston and Preston have created, including the Fight Podcast, which is a seven-part series on the infamous Clemson Carolina Brawl of 04, as well as their Button Gut series that features over 15 plus NFL and college alums, their journey from Husky to healthy, and how they achieved this after football was over. You guys are going to love this conversation. Thank you so much for tuning in. <laughs> Langston, what's happening? How are you, buddy? Good word, man. How's everything your way? Oh my goodness, everything is fantastic, bud. Life is life is going really well. How about you, man? Again, can't complain really when you think about it, right? So, but nah, man, everything looks good for you, man. Y'all there getting skinny, the program running. Y'all out there vacationing, man. Life is good. I like it. Oh yeah, degrees living like that. Uh, you know what I mean? You got to. You got to enjoy it. I mean, God, we only got one shot at this thing. We went to St. Louis, my family, over spring break for the first time. And gosh, what a cool city. I'd, we, I'd only played there one time, and I had a great dinner. I remember where we went, and it was awesome. And But I never spent any time in the city, and I just thought it was super rad. Like, it's a pretty small city overall, and it kind of gets, like, bad press, because they they do have a, a lot of a lot of killings going on there, unfortunately. But I have to say, like the sports are super rad there. The arts there is amazing. the The food is spectacular. It was all, it was a great trip. They've got a bunch of cool like ri- free things for the family to do. Their zoo is amazing and it's free. They got this. There's this thing there called the City Museum. It was like this crazy. You're an artist. You would appreciate this. It's like. It was something that only a crazy person could dream up. It was like this, they had like old buses and tractors and cranes and planes that were sticking off of this old warehouse type building, like five, six stories. And you could like crawl through these metal fabricated tunnels into these old planes and you're 70 feet above the ground. And it was like a crazy uh tim burton if he if he were to design you know some some amusement park it'd be like that's what he would design so i'd I'd like to meet whoever put this thing together but it was rad man it was rad wow when you think about cities like that because like um you know those river cities cities on the river all those different things like um you know those industries in there is similar to like i think i like detroit because like you know all the all the all the fours they dump so much money into like public schools and everything and um i was reading a book about miles davis a couple years ago and it was funny because he grew up in like that st louis area his parents were all owned businesses but his parents wanted to learn um a musical instrument of course of course he was famous for being a trumpeteer but he started learning like with the sousaphone and so because of Budweiser and Isaac Bush, there was a tons of like German folks there. So he got like classically trained in like the sousaphone. 
or something really wild. I got to look up the sousaphone. I don't even know what that is. I think it's like, I think it's like somewhere between like a French horn and a trumpet and like, but you know, so the point was like, you know, oh, cool. Just because of location, of course, you know, Miles went on to be like this savant and trumpeting and everybody wondered, but it's, it goes right back to that. And then that's the cool thing about cities like that, because I mean, there's, you know, when big businesses there, they dump so much into the arts and because they wanted to be cool places for their families and stuff. So, but most yeah. people don't think about that and they forget about that, man. It's, it's wild. Did y'all drive? Did you make it like a road trip? Yeah, we drove. It was four hours. So super easy. Yeah. Road trip, load up. We were going to go out to San Diego and kind of go visit the old stomping grounds. And then they're still kind of under a lot of restrictions and we we really miss live sporting events. I think for our family, that's been the out of COVID, I mean, and not just being able to act like kind of we used to act. It's like live sporting events is the thing that we're really missing the most. Did y'all go to, y'all went to a hockey game, right? Went to, yeah, we went to the Blues game and then the Cardinals happened to be their opening day for the baseball, which they're they're crazy about their baseball team too. Man. It, and it was, it was cool. They just landed uh, this, this off season, they landed Nolan Arenado, who's my wife's favorite player. And he's a, he's a total stud. It's like baseball's hilarious. And I think women love baseball because they can see the men and their, the, the pants just make them look good. So it's like, it's a, uh, it's like, do you like baseball or do you like, yeah, there's no mask on the football, you know what I'm saying? On the baseball, yeah. they can see everything, you know? Exactly. Yeah. So we got to do that. So it's all good. What have you been up to? What's going on? I see you guys get getting the kids all fired up everywhere you go. Yeah, man, trying to get the, you know, continue to do some uh, school visits and all that stuff. So we are uh, finishing up the the third book in this iteration of what we got going on. So, you know, staying on the illustrator with that and, and, and keeping cool. everything going and then, you know, trying to figure out different podcasts, different cool little things that just keep me intrigued, man. And, and of course, battling the bulge, man, of everything. So. <laughs> The, the the weight fight the weight you're talking about yeah man that's always it man so you know it's um like i always say and i think we talked about this when we when we were uh getting you on the podcast is like you know the workout is never the problem is this the is the try not to have that reward after every hard workout or yes you know yeah i did a you know a hundred and some burpees or whatever so but i don't don't waste it. You know what I'm saying? By, you yeah. know, and so again, trying to be consistent with that. And, um, really they call that the, they call that the halo effect, the halo effect, the halo effect. So it's kind of a, it's a weird reward system that humans have built in where we think if we do one really good thing, then we earn something that's maybe a little bad. Right. And it's like, so I did a hundred burpees. So now I get a cupcake or I did this. So I get, you know, I can, I can leak a little bit over here when, yeah. When like we talked, it's like there, you can never out exercise a bad diet. You just, and especially as we're getting older, we can't like, it's just, it's not possible to do it. I watch my kids and I'm like, well, no wonder they stay lean and they can eat whatever they want. Cause they're just sitting there doing like, you know, they're just jumping up always been like he talks to me and i'm like can you settle down you're making me nervous you quit quit moving around quit fidgeting anyway so you got but being aware of that that's the big thing because that's definitely how your mind can play tricks on you because it's not an equal exchange like 100 burpees and one cupcake even if you did just do one cupcake which we know yes <laughs> yeah one cupcake's hard to stop at it's not that's not if i could only do one of anything that would be that would be you know everything would be solved but that's that's i also that makes sense man because i mean the rewards and the exchange aren't aren't always the same either you know same yeah. way with money and different things like that so yeah and then the other the other thought on that would be like the nothing's bad no food's evil right like a cupcake's not evil it's not it's not intentionally causing you harm. Beer's not bad. Alcohol's not bad. You know, all these things like anything, anything's not bad if you can control the limit of it, you know, but where we get into trouble a lot of times is we can't stop eating because they're hyper palatable. They're designed to taste damn good. So we're just like, yeah, I'll have a little bit more. And then you go unconscious eating and you're just like, whoa, what happened there? Like, a, you know, a rack of ribs, which if I were to have a, a, and I hate the word cheat day, but if I were to get after it, it's like, I would go some baby back ribs just covered in sauce and, and get after it. Do you think it's more the sauce or because it's interesting. You always talk about, you know, 
Like some people are just real intermittent fasters. And I know you talk about that uh, calories in calories out, all those different things. And you're right. That's, that's always the, the point is like, um, you know, there's that dude, like you said, who lost a bunch of weight, just eating McDonald's because he, he kept it in his caloric range. So obviously yeah. if you had a deficit. It's going to, it doesn't matter. That doesn't mean you're full on healthy in your numbers and your triglycerides, but if weight loss is your thing, just do that. And, and that'll yes. work. But um, it's always interesting to, 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 I mean, no, the more educated and the more you know about that stuff, the more you can kind of see. Because even when you're talking about like high fructose, like you can't ever get full off of high fructose because it's designed no. that way to just keep. <laughs> yeah. Unlike right. you know, if you just ate a bag of sugar, eventually you'll get full off that. But <laughs> it'll take a while. It'll it'll take a while to get full. The design is wild, man. It's 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 wild to think about all of these things, but. It is. I was think I was thinking about this in a in a little drive that I just had this morning. It's like there's so much information out there that it confuses the hell out of everybody, right? It's like it's too much. It's so everyone wants to be the expert of the expert of the expert. It's like, let me show you this little techie thing that I found over here and all this data points to this. It's like okay, don't let's not go to that minutia at the start of things. Like at the beginning of it, let's go, how many calories am I eating in a day? And roughly how many am I burning? And then within that, like how many am I having in a meal? And then within that, then we can go, okay, now once I have that mastered, we can go, okay, protein, carbs, fat, what works better for me? What do I like better? How many meals should I have in a day? And then we can start working down to like the marginal wins. But overall, you know, you talked about the the blood levels and everything. Like that all sorts itself out when you get down to a healthy weight. Just that's, yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll take care of itself. All right, let's, let's get on to you. Cause I see the t-shirt. You sent me the books after I came on the podcast. They're up in my kid's room. Dude, those are so good. Chicken little and chicken little too. What's the, what's the third iteration going to be called? The third iteration is going to be called Eusta was a rooster. So it's kind of like coming full circle where, um, you know, of course, we based it all on our mascot, South Carolina. We I don't know who uh, why we decided to chicken. Thomas, some, I do know the history, but I act like I don't know. But <laughs> a chicken is our mascot. It's a Gamecock. And then so, you know, we tied in all that. So we took one of the older chickens who was the mascot, who was kind of in his heydays um, and just kind of like reaching back and trying to give some game to like the guy who's kind of like in this in between life right now. So he's, he's had some success, um, you know, but you know, getting a little bit fatter, you know, all those different things. So, <laughs> you know, used to was the rooster who was the old guy who used to be the man on the block or on the farm. And then, you know, he's just trying to, cause eventually we'll all be somewhere in that cycle, whether we'll be the person who doesn't believe in ourselves, then we overcome that. Then we have some success and then, or eventually we'll be old with all of this knowledge. And then, you know, just trying to spit some game to the younger guys. So uh, it's been cool to kind of do that, come up with these ideas. And it definitely kept us busy during the uh, the pandemic. That's that's one thing it kind of locked us into, you know, you can't eat but so much, right? So we were working on the books and it's been fun. So we just got some drawings back today and it's hopefully we'll have it by uh, January 1st published and, and put out there for the world. And I'll definitely make sure I send you some. Oh, awesome. Awesome. They're, they are so cool. And in my head, I was like, gosh, I wish Purdue had something like this because there, it's cool to get a history, a little bit of a history of the mascot behind the school, but I think what is really special about it is they're inspirational, right? It's like you're just a chicken, but it's not just, you're not just a chicken, right? You're anything you want to be. Like you can grow into be anything you want to be. It's like the, get, be, get behind the label of what the name is or what the word is that it's associated with you. It's like, yeah, but ultimately you're a chicken. It's like, no, 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 I, I am what I want to be. I think that's, to me, that's awesome. Yeah, and, and it's crazy because, of course, football, we learned the story from Lou Holtz. Um, you know, it was a story where, you know, he was trying to change the culture at Carolina when he got there and obviously trying to change the mindset. And he told us a story about an eagle that, that got dropped into a chicken coop when he was young and he grew up his whole life never realizing uh, that he had, you know, they all got wings, but they don't think they can fly. And one day they were all, you know, milling around in the barnyard and the eagle looked up and asked the other chickens like, man, what's that flying in the air? And he's like, man, that's the eagle. You know, they fly. We don't ever do that. And then just because, I mean, and that's a lot of us, we have a lot of 
uh, laden things inside of us that we just, you know, because of whatever our geography or my mom didn't do it. So I'm, I'll never do that. Or my dad was overweight. So I'll always be overweight. That's my lot in life. So, you know, a lot of times it takes somebody else to kind of come and shake us. And, but sometimes it's the older folks we have to shake a little bit too um, and changing up that paradigm. So that's why we love to kind of, of course, have fun, make the stories, but also, you know, share those things because those are timeless things we all kind of have to go through, you know, whether, wherever we are in our life's journey. Isn't that interesting? You said change the paradigm up a little bit with the older folks. It's like, no, 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 you don't, you don't have to give in. You don't have to quit. And one thing I, I heard this message a little bit back was it's okay to dream. Like you have permission to dream, to become something no matter what age you are, whether you're a child, whether you're like us or whether you're older than us, like you can, you can continue to dream of better and then chase that. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I mean, I think you, I, what do they say? You know, you, you start growing up when you, we start dreaming, uh, Peter Pan, you know, that's, that was the whole thing that got him out of the, out of Never Neverland. It's like, he started to really be a boy and, and it's like, I'm got to be a man. And so, and I, I think that's something for me, I'm um, just talking about transitioning from football, but like we put so much into this dream of like, okay, I want to go play football at this level and then that level. Okay. So once you start checking off those dreams, it's like, man, that's why you got to figure out what are those other things that you've always dreamed about. And especially now that, you know, you're, you're young, you're in that sweet spot of, you got a little bit of money, you got some time, uh, but you also know, you know, you're, you're never going to have, you know, the, the ability or maybe any other time to do it than now. So that's where we kind of jumped in with our books where like, you know, you know, everybody's doing camps or everybody's going to school and talking, but we want to talk about this. We want to do that. Let's show them some other cool stuff and things that, that keep us interested. And so that's, that's really what we kind of try to tell everybody. And it's, and it's interesting, man, when we go into the schools and talk to the kids, the teachers will come up to us afterwards and be like, man, well, I got this idea for this. Or I've always wanted to do that. And then for us, they see emails later on where teachers like, I started my book or I started going back to school. And cause I, I mean, we have a dream deferred, you know, Langston Hughes, my, thank goodness my mom named me after somebody who was kind of like a, a poet. So, you know, that's okay, cool. Don't let those dreams die. And that's, I think that's always the biggest thing in life, man. So to always have that, that little bit of a thing to, to pull you forward. Isn't that special when the, when the teachers and the administrators and the buildings that you're going into, like you're going there for the kids, but they're like, man, I'm going for it now. That's when, when you can stoke that, you know, you're really touching everybody in that space. That is, that's special. That's got to feel so powerful. It does, man. And, and it's, I, I joke with people. I mean, football was great, but like, finding those little nuggets of like, you know, joy, similar to like what you found on the football field when you made that perfect block or you put your head on the right placement and it just, you know, it got that five yard game, but like only you and the few folks know about that. And that, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's real, it's real similar to that feeling. And I'm just really thankful that, you know, was able to kind of tap into that and find some stuff. Cause there's a lot of guys out there, you know, and not just football dudes, but people in general are just get caught up in the monotony of life. And next thing you know, you look up and, you've been doing something for 40 years and you might not have really wanted to end up being there, but you know, life happens when you plan other things. So that's why you always got to make sure you're, you're intentional. I think a lot of stuff. Yeah. And that's, I was having that thought this morning as I was going through the workout and I was just like, kind of put my hands in there and I'm like, hallelujah, man, I get a, I get to do for a living what I love to do. And you're doing what you love to do and you're passionate about doing it and you get to wake up. But, and I'm, I'm really careful about it as like, you never want to tell people to like, you got to just find what you love to do and do it because I get it. Like in the the real world, it's not necessarily that way that you can't just go, Hey, screw off my job. I don't love it. It's like, I still got to put food on the table. The struggle is real. But at the same time, when you're talking to these teachers at these schools and they're like, Hey, I've been putting this on the back burner for a long time. And while I'm teaching, I'm also going to be passionate about this. And I can transition into that if I can get it to turn into something. And if not, I love it anyway. So it's not work. It's not, it's not like anything I feel like I'm doing is work. It's fun. I get to talk to cool people. I get to work out on a daily basis. I get to learn. It's like you get to do the same thing on a daily basis. And that's when you eventually keep showing up every day. And, that, and that's how we know what makes successful people is just keep showing up, being consistent in what, whatever it is, you know, they're doing, whether it be, you know, trying to be a cello player, a sousaphone person, whatever that is, or like you said, trying to, uh, you know, figure out some ways to work out and, and or make workouts better or help other people. And, and that's, that's the, 
that's been really the cool thing, the blessing um, to really be able to to have that. Because like you said, man, it could it could be worse. I mean, it could be punching the clock or, you know, in the words of, of uh, my man, Jim Morrison, man, trading your hours for a little handful of dimes. Right. And, and at the end of the day, like, what do you have for that? So, you know, we always say and that's what we kind of tell kids, um, you know, the passion doesn't always pay, especially in the front of front part of it, but it'll keep you hungry to build those skills that will keep you figuring out ways to create a program or make it more digestible or work for a, a niche group. And then you kind of find a way to give value back to people. And then lo and behold, you kind of create something that can sustain you. Yes. Yeah. And, and your passion is infectious, right? So when you're, when you love what you're doing and you're good, just putting that joy out there, people respond. It's like, I don't even, I, I hear this about John Gruden. I know some guys that played for Gruden. They're like, I have no idea what he would say in these team meetings, but I would leave and I would just be so fired up. And it was like, what did he say? It's like, I don't know what he said, but it didn't matter. Like, I'm going, we're going for it. It's like, all right, let's go win this game. It's like, okay, cool. But that's kind of it. It's like, people feel your energy. They feel your joy. They feel your how much you love what you're doing. And then they feed off of that in their own way which kind of brings me to this like you're going into these schools with the kids and it's like I don't know what the uh the staff tells their kids hey we're gonna go talk about reading but it, you know for a lot of kids I would imagine coming to the auditorium or whatever they're they're like we're gonna go learn about reading and then I see like their reaction and they're just like the roof is about to blow off how do you guys get that well, it's funny because like, even though we will prime the schools and tell the teachers and, and we'll be like, you, you know, we have a book and we, I mean, we, we will come in there and try to hook the kids with the football stuff. Um, but you know, this is what we're coming in here to talk about literacy, talk about these different things, talk about being creators, you know, ideas and different things. And people are like, oh yeah, 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 that's cool. Well, let's talk about the football. And that's, that's just the beauty of being able to play a game and especially living in the South where it's like, what do they say? It's like God. And then in like one A and one B is like football dependent upon your school and then you're <laughs> yeah. and that stuff. So like the kids are already kind of halfway geeked and, I, and it, it always makes us kind of laugh because we're like, man, we're old, man. Like these kids weren't even alive when we played, man. Like, you know, <laughs> but that just shows you how much football is the deal for everybody doesn't even yeah. doesn't even matter if you don't know the difference between a quarterback and a kicker or whatever like that but the point is once we get them hooked and then we come in there um and then of course bring the energy and try to make what we like to call our reading workout where we take the kids through literacy lessons where we're talking about um you know inferencing skills and figuring out you know how to use these things to pick up and find the right books because again like we tell kids man like the same stuff i was reading probably in second and third grade i'm probably reading a lot of that stuff now but it's just bigger books like you like you talked about reading magazine articles and stuff about fitness and weight loss it doesn't surprise me now that you're writing programs and doing things about that because that's just what you do and that's yeah. what we tell kids man like i'm not telling you to go out there and read war and peace i wouldn't read war and peace but what I <laughs> no thanks is, find something out there that you like because there's a billion books out there right now and if there's not a book out there start writing it because that's probably your little niche right there there's probably you know a cat that needs to be in outer space that does i don't know something out there and that's the thing we try to tell kids is like you know there's there's tons of the the way you put a whole bunch of money in your pocket the way you put a whole put a whole bunch of options in front of you is to be really skillful and we know skills aren't you're not born being a good reader writer or speaker you can get better at those things um, so again, just like you've done with the fitness stuff, just diving into the thought process of the halo effect and all these different things. Um, now it starts to all kind of make sense. And then you start to see, man, I'm a little bit of an expert and that gives you confidence. And it's no different right. than sports because we'll do this with sports. Like if I'm lacking in something, if I really want to play basketball, but I know I can't shoot, I'll go find a coach or I'll go find a whatever. Our parents will help us go find those things. Yes. But when it comes to like education and, and those things, We'll just be like, oh man, this is just what I am, and I'm I'm dumb. I don't know what it is. And that's not true. It's all about skills, and we can all get better at those skills every day. So that's what we really try to preach and get the kids excited. And they believe us, man. And that's that's the fun part, man, seeing that they believe us. Well, they should believe you because it's true. It is it's about teaching the growth mindset. And you're right. It's like we, it's so much of our society does that with sports, where you're willing to pay anything to go get a private coach, to be on the select team, to travel across the country, to compete in all these tournaments and and get better. And it's to me, it's easy to see growth physically on the field and we can see batting averages, we can see performances on field and we go, oh yeah, I'm definitely improving. So this is paying off and I'll just stick with it. 
But I, I think the mental side of things, it takes longer to be rewarded for the effort that you're putting in and you don't really even, it's, it's hard to, I guess, have baselines or measurements of where am I growing here and what is this all for? It's like, well, they tell me I should come to school and I should learn. Great. But like on the football field, we know we won. So, or we lost and maybe we won and this block wasn't very good. And so I can go back and I can clean that up. But in the academic world, it's not quite as, you don't know, it's not quite as transparent to what needs to be improved and how we can do it. But I love the thought of like, if you're struggling in one area, it's not you. And that's a, that's a thought that I'm trying to, like with my own kids, trying to get them to get over. It's like, it's never acceptable to say, oh, it's just me. Like, it's just me means you're copping out of some work that could be done to improve that portion of you, which maybe is lagging. It's like, oh, it's just me. It's like, okay, well, you can say that, but it doesn't have to be you if you don't want, if you're, you're choosing that. 100%. And I had a coach tell me one time, and it's always funny because it's funny, like, how football coaches seem, like, really infinite, wi infinitely wise, but, like, excuses only satisfy the person that makes them, right? So if I'm telling myself at a young age, like, I'm, I'm not good at this. And this is just, you know, you'll start to believe it. Because even if you say it silently to yourself, and that's the other thing we tell kids is like, you know, be careful of your self-talk. And this is things I have to work on all the time because you're always listening. Um, and depending upon your mood or different things like that, that's why having the physical part of your body together and along with your brain, like it all matters. And, you know, going back to this idea that our brain is a muscle, like you said, like if I want to get, you know, if I got a bird chest, I know if I eventually just do one push up a day, I can start to see it a little bit. But if your brain yeah. being a muscle, it's tough. Uh, and that's what we tell kids. Like you might not see or feel the benefit of being sharper or more creative if you just pick up the habit of reading, maybe going from zero to maybe five minutes a day or whatever it is you need to start doing. Uh, but all of a sudden you'll start a word will drop in there. And then, you know, you're, you'll start having different ideas and then things will start getting clear to you. You'll start writing clearer. And now again, you're not going to be writing Shakespeare, but it's a lot different than where you were. And you talk about the physical thing of that. That's where we really tell kids, you know, the, the results, everything is a muscle. Your brain is a muscle, but it's not going to develop. You're not going to see it poking out. Like if you've been doing yeah. the summer, but that doesn't mean the work isn't happening. Now we know if you don't do anything, your arm's going to be flabby. It's the same way with your brain. So, you know, it's, it's just that constant keep showing up, you know, five minutes a day, you know, whatever it is. And eventually you'll start to see the benefits of it. And that's where the kids kind of see the confidence. And I mean, just we're getting tons of people asking us for, you know, test taking things. And the things we always tell, tell, tell schools and teachers is like the best thing you do to prepare for a test because you're not going to teach them all types of stuff the week before. It's just to read, just get really comfortable, just cognitively reading things and being more comfortable about that. And I mean, that's really the best thing you do. And kids will do very well on the test, just reading for pleasure before they take these standardized tests and different things. So of course they got to sleep well, eat that breakfast, do all those things. Yes. It's really cool, man. And it, it all goes. But the reading you're saying, you're saying the reading turns on the brain. It stimulates the brain and gets it ready to, to take the test. And, um, and this is the things we know, like the left side of your brain is like the, the logical linear you're thinking about this, but the right side is like the you know, the creative, the imagination. And so you want to tap into the right side more so than your left because the left can be kind of, you know, real strict and concrete. But that idea of reading just occupying the left side of the brain while also reading and you get the picture in your brain. And so it's working to, it's somehow working both sides of the brain. Yeah. It makes it better. And it's just like, you know, when you do the right workout, you know, not killing yourself, but not doing, you know, enough where you're not straining enough, but it's that finding that sweet spot, man. And that's the things we try to get with the kids is just to find that sweet spot, find the books you like and be creative because who knows, man. And it's been it's been fun because we uh, we, visit, we worked with a school last week um, and they had a kid publish. Uh, he was a fifth grader. He published his own book. Um, he like they sent it off to Google to get it printed up for him. Okay. They, had some, they had some of the other kids like draw some of the pictures and edit it for him. And that's all that's collaboration. That's everything we want the kids to eventually grow up. In. Now, who knows if the book is good or not? And my whole thing is. My hat's off to you. Matter. It took me 30, 40 years almost to, to <laughs> write my first book with a whole bunch of, you know, bravado and stuff behind me. So that's why I tell kids, y'all got it early. Just don't forget it later on when you when you think you're too cool or, man, guys don't read or, you know, all that stuff. No, that's not true. And, and isn't it funny that you come back to, like, and, I, and I know I do anyway, it's like, gosh, I wish I would have been more mindful in school. 
gosh, I wish I would have, I wish, I, I wish I would have studied what I want to study now, or I wish I would have had the mindset that I do now where like, you just get into what you love and you can geek out and you can spend countless hours doing it and it's not work and it's not like, but you get in this weird place where it's school work and it's like, but you get the chance to go to college hopefully. And when you're there, then you've got the option to be able to pick what you love to do, pick what you love to learn about and go from there. Let me ask, cause you, you said, uh, you're reading it. You read a Miles Davis book recently. What do you, what do you read on a, What's your, what's your gig? Right now I'm reading uh, three or four different books and there's one I'll definitely send you because I think this will be right up your alley. Um, our- do you keep a couple on the nightstand? I do. I try to, I try to, it's, it's like, I try to keep books kind of like everywhere. Uh, and I learned this from my buddies and my partners, the guys who are super well read. But it's funny when I think about it, my mom was the same way. Like she'd have books all the time. Now, again, I used to look at her crazy because she taught school, but like at night she'd come home and read for pleasure. I'd be like, lady, like you spend all day teaching like, <laughs> like me who, who don't want to read don't and you come home and read but that's the that's the pleasure part of it and, and yeah. you know usually the book falls on her face she falls asleep right <laughs> yeah um a lot of the stuff i'm reading right now i'm reading a uh, general caslin's book it's uh it's it's the exact title is character of something of character and then basically it's a uh, it's basically a book he wrote um he was the uh general and um headmaster over there at army uh their their school and now he's the president at at the university of south carolina so just knowing who he is what kind of guy he is i mean this is a guy who ran into the pentagon during 9 11 and pulled guys out like a serious dude and but like character is his biggest thing over that and so reading a bunch of books about that spiritual economics i kind of keep that on rotation all the time that's an eric buttersworth eric butterworth book um what else am i reading right now um i'm trying to get into a little bit more fiction because i can get really heavy into the biographies i can get really heavy into like the history stuff and it's funny when you mention it like talking about like man if i could do it all over again like i never thought i would want to be like a history major because ain't no money in that right ain't no money in history so for me i i I majored in business when i went to school but i flunked out so i had to go find something else thank goodness because (laughs) it wasn't gonna be my bag but now that I'm older, I'm like, man, I'm just super into history, super into biographies, because it's no different than watching like your favorite football guy. You start reading up on those guys and you start to see clues of like along the way, like that's why he was successful. And Oh, OK, that makes sense. And because we usually just see the finished product and we just kind of sit there and all like, oh, man, that's he must have came down from a comet or something. And, you know, that's that's the difference, like you said, with the halo effect and different thing. Our brain plays tricks on us. But if you look back deep enough, it's been a long kind of sequential small incremental steps to their success throughout their life and you know what it's it's wild now in the time that we grew up it was like there was seven jobs that we thought you could possibly have right and everybody had the exact same seven jobs if you weren't going to be a professional athlete but now and I tell my kids this all the time it's like just do what you love doing and there's a way to build a business around that now i mean there is there is a niche of a niche of a niche you can find you can go down and you can i got a buddy whose kids making money he's like 10 years old he's making money doing backflips on trampolines it's like I mean, you could teach everybody how to do backflips on trampolines and it's like but to the thing it's like you could be a history major and be really good at whatever comes out of that and there's ways to make money. So I think it's a, it's a unique time to be a kid. I think it's an incredibly challenging time to be a kid because of there's a lot of things that they're exposed to that we weren't exposed to in social media. I think it's unique, but it's also really challenging for them, but it also opens up a ton of different avenues that they could potentially explore. So you don't have to just do the five jobs, be a fireman, a policeman, an accountant, a lawyer, you know, it's like, those are the things, this is, this is what you can do. Here's your, here's your option. Just choose one. So the things we like to always talk to the kids about, and even to the parents is like, um, you know, the combination of things like, you know, uh, chicken is great and fried chicken is even better, but fried chicken on a sandwich Oh man, that's, but there's people who have made billion dollar industries like Chick-fil-A didn't invent the chicken sandwich. They, they just said, they just put it on the bun, you know? And so, and that's the cool thing about all these different like skills um, and different things that kids can do. And then you combine in the internet, 
um, they can get super creative with like, like you said, like teaching people makeup tutorials. And I mean, oh, oh yeah, it's, it's, it's like you said, I know, I know there's kids out here who are paying, uh, teaching kids not just to do backflip stuff, which well, I would have been all over when I was a kid, but kids out here day trading or trading cars or trading, <laughs> trading sneakers and, and doing all these things and they're figuring it out. Um, and that's the cool thing. And I, and I really, that's kind of gets me excited from the kids, but that's where we're not just left out to the cold as like the adults, their parents, because they're so, you know, still socially awkward or they still need help with figuring out how to approach people. Yes. And, to people. and you know, with anything in business, like the sale is made making connections with people, you know, that flesh to flesh, the more you can talk to somebody and get those things and get those testimonies going, the more you'll get people buying into your business because it's not you just telling them about it, it's other people but if you don't get from behind your screen it's going to be hard to do that even if you are the best back flipper and you can teach the anybody in the world even a 300 pound old dude to do it you know, <laughs> until, until you figure out a way to like approach that person or whatever and that's where the gold is made and so that's where i think that's the fine balance so you point. know it's for us old folks to realize man you know they're not going to be on the same kind of path trajectory for a job like we thought we was go to college because I mean there's kids that won't even have to go I mean I know some kids that make probably six figures doing lawn care businesses and and, and different wow. things and for me to tell that kid man go to college I'll be like nah don't go to college Why? <laughs> yeah it's true it is and and we start with that it's like oh no boys you're going to college but if they've got a great idea and they're really passionate about something and they can turn it into a career by all means but right by by all means, if you, if you've got the knowledge to be able to do that and turn it into something, then go for it. But if not, college is a great way to to grow up, spend some time, figure it out, pay some bills, hopefully keep your apartment clean, and <laughs> keep your keep yourself alive. It, yeah, and just keep. Uh, and, and again, it's just. I mean, and that's the one thing. I mean. I learned with everything in life is that it's all practice. Even the games are practice. Um, Cause we're all just out here trying to figure out what works best for us. And we take those wins from the day before and add them to the next day. And so, um, and that's kind of the hard thing in life, but a lot of times the kids don't like to fail. They don't like to, you that's know, right. especially fail in public. And that's the thing we always try to tell them. I mean, hurry up and get that sorry out there. Hurry up and get over that uncomfortableness that all that now, cause the sooner you do that, the better off you'll be. Cause you'll go out into the world and not be so self-conscious and, and, you know, you won't cut yourself off from the world. And we might, I might need that gift. You know, I might need that game you got inside of you, but if you're too self-conscious to talk to me, cause you think I got it figured out, man, nah, nah. And so, and that's the cool thing about all of this, um, you know, about being an author going back into the schools is that you get to hang around the kids and see what's cool. And then you start to see, oh, they don't got it all the way figured out. I'm still kind of cool myself. I'm, I'm still wearing the right sneakers and stuff. So it's all good. <laughs> it's, it's, it's super rewarding, super fun. Yeah, I'm sure it is. Tell me about your childhood. You grew up on James Island, right? Down in South Carolina. What was that like? It was it was great. I grew up in uh, Charleston. Uh, so James Island is like right next to uh, downtown Charleston. and. Uh, great great place to grow up in it's crazy because growing up i hated it you know man it's too small here you know it's so much history i mean i hate living here. i'm <laughs> living like atlanta and charlotte and now everybody and their mother kills themselves to get to charleston everybody's oh man you're from charleston the food yeah and so like that's that's the beauty of like you never know how good you got it till you get older um you know tons of history tons of different cultures intersecting down there um of course had sports had you know, a little bit of the rural life, but a little bit of what we call, quote, quote, su uh, suburban city kind of life. I wouldn't say Charleston's a huge city, but just enough. And I think just enough to not make me so kind of young and dumb, but also enough to know that I don't have it all. And I mean, it's just been really cool. I mean, growing up in when they would come shoot movies down there, Bill Murray making his home down there, just all those different things. So like I said, my mom was a teacher, um, could never really kind of get away with anything. So, cause she knew all the teachers across the schools and all that stuff, yeah. so she would hear about it. And then my dad was in radio for years. Um, and so that was the other thing. He was kind of like the, the you know, had the number one radio show in the morning and all this stuff. So it was funny, kids would always know what was going on. I'd be at all the concerts, all the festivals and all that stuff. But, you know, it was work because I'm standing over there with my dad. But, you know, kids think, oh, man, you get to do all the cool stuff. But, you know, just like within life, everything somewhere in the middle is the reality. So me and my brother, uh, he's uh, like I told you, he grew up and uh, he's about 10 years older than me. He went to IU and then uh, Ball State. So we spent a lot of time driving back and forth up to Indiana, Fort Wayne, oh. different places. And um, just super, super blessed, man, because I had, uh, you know, 
you know, that's just that right mix of my mom being a teacher, taking me places. And like, I remember like they took me to the Biltmore house when I was young. I was like, man, why are we going to this, man? This is stupid, man. Why are we? And then, you know, later on, I'm like, I'm telling everybody, man, we got to take our daughter to the Biltmore house. It's phenomenal. And when you think about it, like the amount of money those folks had, the, the Biltmores had and everything, they built that entire city in Asheville. And uh, it's just wild. And then again, you know, I always say the older I get, the smarter my parents get. So I, uh, Isn't that the truth? I can't ever really complain about, you know, uh, how we were. You have kids? At everything. Yeah, I got a 15 year old roommate, man. So I just, you know, do whatever <laughs> she tells me. She borrows <laughs> She borrows all my money, asks me to take her everywhere, and you know, just never gives me five stars on the app. But um, <laughs> great. She's a she's a great girl. She's super talented, super smart, and uh, you know, with me, I just try to stay out the way because she's got. I'm like, man, you got school figured out. Like, there was the other day, like Friday night, she was doing her homework. I'm like, what's wrong with you? Like, you sure you doing homework? Like, I would have said that to like lie to somebody when I was coming up, growing up. You know what I'm saying? Just to get out the house, but she's genuinely, earnestly, you know, just really competitive and. You know, she's just a great kid. So, you know, of course, still want to protect her because she's my daughter and, you know, always want to be little to me, baby to me. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's been really fun, man, just seeing her grow up and travel around and follow her with her with gymnastics and softball and all that cool stuff. Oh, that is that is super special. And I love the idea of staying out of her way. Right. Like there, there's so many parents that lean so hard on the kids. But sometimes you need to let the kids just do their own thing, fail on their own, succeed on their own. And then by the time they get 15, you're like, I don't, this, this is a self-sustaining deal here. I can give you some advice if you want some, but I don't have to be running a real militant ship because I've allowed you all that room to figure out who you are and what you want to do and find success. Right. And you got to trust, like, you did a good enough job as a parent, like, up to this point. Like, she knows right from wrong. You know, now sometimes you might just, well, you know, that what is that front part of their brain is not really developed yet. So they do yeah. uh, still will do some wild stuff. So that's where you might have to tap them on the shoulder a little bit. But like, it's really just like leaning in and trusting because you and you and I both know, uh, maybe I'm just speaking for myself. Tell them, but if if I was 15 and I probably had somebody who could come pick me up in a car, I had a day license. Like if I really wanted to do something, I would do it, you know, oh, yeah. better that's and different. Right. And so no matter what my parents told me, you know, and that's the one thing I kind of, you know, I remember is that, you know, no matter how I can, if I'm going to be that parent that says, don't do that, that's the first thing they're going to do. You know, it's, yes. it's kind of like the kid, like who never party drank, did anything in high school, that first weekend in college, they're blacked out drunk somewhere. It's because it's too, too far end of one extreme, same way with food, same way with anything. So that's exactly I think right. that's also one of the best lessons my parents gave me was like, you know, okay, you want to go play football? You're going to go have to go talk to that coach. I'm not going to stand there with you. So you're, you're not going to practice today. You're going to have to call the coach. And it's amazing to me, like, how many parents will interject. I see this when I was doing the sideline radio stuff with, with Carolina, like, hearing stories about parents calling up to their college coach every day, like, are you checking? <laughs> Little John John is not. And I'm like, this is just what? going through high school. Yes. And it happens more to you than you think. And it makes sense because, uh, you know, when the, when the coaches are recruiting the parents and recruiting the kids, you know, the parents kind of get this this false sense that, you know, I can always call Will Muschamp or Nick Saban. And, and that might be – they might tell you that on that recruiting weekend in March, but, like, when it's the middle of August – They don't mean it. Out, nah, hell no. <laughs> they, they do not, not mean it. <laughs> not at all. And so that's the beautiful thing. And I, I think another kind of gift to – for me, you know, not that I was the big enough size, but, like, my parents – you know, made me a little bit more responsible in that sense where, you know, okay, you, you're you going to go tell the coach why you're not playing this week because you didn't want to do your homework and your ass didn't want to pass class. So I'm not the one. I just told you what the consequences were going to be. And then you tried me. And so now go embarrass yourself. And, <laughs> yeah. But it's, an, it's, it's exactly that lesson that I need because you think about, I mean, just things we do in a professional world, just hearing the stories of just a lot of people just have never you know, quit a job or, or figured out ways to talk to them. They just don't ever do that. And the first time they ever do that is when they're adult. And it's really, really tough for them because a lot of them are digital natives and they don't have to, it's easier for them to send an email than it is to come in there and sit down face to face and have that conversation or ask for that raise or do all those. It's challenging. That's very, yeah, it's very challenging. I think there was some, some great brilliance in what you said there, because you're right. It's if you tell somebody to do something, they're going to do exactly opposite. There's a lot, a lot of people are built like that. My youngest is just like that, where if I say, don't do this, 
he will immediately do just that. It's it's almost immediate and it's defiant and it's just in his nature. And I've learned recently there's this trick that I use on him and it's like a Jedi mind trick. It's been so amazing. I wonder when he's going to get on to me, but I just ask him, hey, would you mind? Or hey, have you thought about? And then he just does it and it's like this I, I don't know what's different about it, but just simply asking instead of telling has changed our relationship in just such a wonderful way. It's like, don't, I stop telling him anything because he's ultimately going to do what he wants to do anyway. And, and I, I'm glad we figured this out at seven rather than at 17 when I'm still yelling at him. But it's like, hey, bud, have you thought about this? Would you mind doing that for dad? You know, that'd be really, that'd be really nice of you. Thanks, bud. You know, and just like, instead of pushing him, it's like embracing him. Just, hey, come here real quick. Because I think every, every- It's not an absence of like discipline or anything. Because again, if he, you, that's the cool thing about being a parent. You'll be those guardrails whenever they need to show up and appear. But like, like you said, figuring out those things and and, and kind of seeing that reverse psychology. I saw my, my wife do it to our daughter the other day. Um, You know, just- she was like, I'm going to ask her this and see how she responded and, and right on cue. And again, maybe she figured this trick out and I, she's just not <laughs> telling me about it, but like, you know, and, and, and I don't know what that is about, even as an adult right now, somebody says, man, you got to pay your tax. What is it? April 15th. You got to pay your taxes on April 15th. I'm going to like, no, I don't. I'm going to write an extension, man. I'm going to do no, what we're good. Doing. Yeah. Yeah. And so even if I, you know, even if I do have all my stuff and I can submit it today, I'm still, it's just something in us human nature. And some, sometimes for a lot of us that, that, that resistance is a lot louder than others, but man, especially, you know, man, you know, your kids, man, they're, they're, they're just like you. And that's the one thing I've been learning. Like the things that, that piss me off about my daughter are the things I really see in myself. And that's really, you know, if you spot it, you got it. You know, one of those different. (laughs) I like that. I like that. If you spot it, you got it. What was, what was Lou Holtz like as a coach? What did he give you? Uh, first year, I w- I thought he was a megalomaniac, crazy man. Just what the hell is wrong with him? He wears the same thing every day. He smells like a a, a corn cob pipe, tobacco. Like, <laughs> did he smoke? Wrong? Oh man, Lou Holtz was a, 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 a. I mean, he smoked a pipe, and it was like he had, <laughs> was he had, he had like a captain's black. Uh, it was a certain type of tobacco, but it just real fragrant, real vanilla. But like. It smelled like old people to me. Like <laughs> he was, he is old. He was old. Log cabin guy <laughs> smelling like like all the time, you know. But <laughs> Lou was um Lou was he was a he was a taskmaster. He was a hard ass. He was, but it was everything I needed, uh, everything we all needed and wanted. And I always, I always say that was kind of like his brilliance. His brilliance wasn't X's and O's, or uh, his brilliance was that he knew how to figure out how to get. Langston Moore going, but he knew how to get Nick Hardwick going, but he also knew how to get every other, he just knew the thumb screws for every guy. And he understood that it was different, um, you know, from guys who didn't have parents and just being a little bit more gentler with them, but wouldn't let those guys get over on them, you know? So right. the thing we always say is like, man, I just wish I recorded and wrote down more stuff from these meetings because we'd have these team meetings every day, twice a day. Um, but he would start off with like worldly news and, he would start off with telling us about things going on in different parts of the world. We're like, we're sitting there feeling sorry for ourselves um, after we just had this huge breakfast and we got to go out here and play on this immaculate field and practice. But he's talking about apartheid and, and Nelson Mandela and uh, these, you know, this plan is leaving this town and it's going to affect these people this way and think about that stuff. Uh, but from that, not just doing stuff like that to getting guys to get up and share stories about their life. Cause you think, you know, a person, but, you know, having guys, four or five guys every day get up and tell things and guys crying uh, from things wow. about, you know, telling stories about, you know, not being kicked out, being homeless, to being abused, to, I mean, good things to, I mean, and that's, it's funny because that's the caring you got to have. Like, I care about this dude. Yeah, that's my offense alignment, but I really care about this dude because I know about it. I know his, when I see his yes. mom and, and that plight, now, okay, it, it makes sense to me. And it's funny, the, the best teams I've ever been on are the ones that really, really genuinely care, right? The, the ones who genuinely, you know, it wasn't the most talented teams, yeah. uh, it wasn't the most competent teams, it was the guys who were willing to show up, follow up. Uh, oh man, I hadn't seen so-and-so at the workout, man. I'm gonna go get him. I'm not just gonna call him, I'm gonna go drive over there, pound on the door and go get him. 
And so it took about a year or two for that to get going. But once it go, once he got it going, that cycle kind of like took care of itself. But the thing with that is, and that's kind of where ultimately he had to transition out is, you know, after a while, his meshes, I think it kind of falls on deaf ears. And that's the amazing thing of like a Nick Saban or programs that have a whole bunch of success and guys genuinely can care because, I mean, there's talent everywhere, but like it's the guys willing to go the extra mile for each other, prepare to, you know, I'm going to show up in shape because I'm not going to let Nick down because I know Nick's been over there busting his ass the whole summer. And I know he's going to do me if I'm not in shape, but also <laughs> I owe it to him to be at my best yeah. as well. And so like doing, like going through all of that, it was funny when I got into the NFL, I always joke and say, I played for the worst team, Cincinnati, Arizona, and Detroit. But like, that was the biggest thing was like a lot of guys didn't care. It was just picking up the check. There were some friendships here and there, but like as a collective, like, you know, you wouldn't care if this guy didn't show up the next day, as long as you got your check. And, and it kind of yeah. showed when it came down to, you know, nut cutting time, competing time. And I think that's why y'all were super successful in San Diego, because not only did y'all find the right mix of talent, you had a bunch of young guys, but y'all all kind of were like a tight knit group. Yes. Uh, y'all just happened to be in the damn AFC and the Colts and, and the chart and, and the, uh, and the, <laughs> the Patriots are super great, man. So, but the point is y'all are, I always think about that when I think about, even to this day, when I see you guys interact on social media, you can just tell that's genuine friendship there. And that's, yeah. that's how I think all organizations, even families, you know what I'm saying? There's a lot of families who don't even operate to that depth. And I think the more you get into the caring, the more your organization, your, your team, your franchise can go. Yeah. The cool thing that we had was we all grew up together. Like we, cause our team basically got rebuilt in about two years and we all just came in this thing at the same time and we got all really good together and we partied together. We do everything with a massive amount of us. And then we had, they did a really nice job of selectively having some free agent, older veterans that we brought in that kind of steered the young wildness, but they, they did a great job of assembling the crew. And I think it's really important. The vulnerability that Lou had the guys express, I think is irreplaceable when you're talking about, and I, I a hundred percent agree with you that the more you care about your teammates, the more you're willing to do, the more you're willing to work and you're not willing to let them down that, I've always believed that the team who ultimately wins the Super Bowl cares the most about each other because they're going to put the most time, effort, energy, and focus into the game, and they're willing to play through more than everybody. And that's, you know, you talk about playing for Cincinnati, Arizona, Detroit. I think the hard thing in those organizations is you can give all the effort you want, but in places like that that have historically been bad, you don't feel like you're getting any support. So it's hard to go max effort when you're like, I'm giving all I have is the organization. Do they even care if we win? Like they're not putting Cincinnati notoriously doesn't fund, doesn't fund the team, right? It's like notorious where when we did the CBA in 2010 or 11, it was like pointed directly at Cincinnati and said, you have to have a minimum cash spend because you're spending. And they it was like 60% of the cap every year. It was like, it, it, it's atrocious. And these guys, of course you don't feel like you can win. It was, I mean, criminal. And that's why guys like Calvin Johnson burn out, you know, like you said, yeah. Calvin, Calvin can do all of those. Barry Sanders. Sanders. Barry Sanders. I mean, same way. I mean, you start looking at different guys from Cincinnati, just eventually just kind of burn themselves out or just aren't as passionate. And, and so, and that's the thing with, um, I've always tried to remember with just like anything when we're talking about leadership or when we go into speaking to companies is that, um, and there's, there was a phenomenal Ted talk about, um, I think it was a group of like oilers um, and they had so many, uh, like they worked on a rig and there were so many injury things and they were just trying to figure out different ways to cut down on injuries. Like, I mean, deadly injuries because of the oil spills, but what they found that really worked was they had all these protocols in place to, you know, to check this, make sure you got this harness on, make sure this is, you know, when you're transitioning, but the biggest thing that changed it for them and dropped their injury rate to like 50% from whatever godly number was, was guys going around the room and sharing and just telling stories just about their life and what they're doing when they're not on the rig. And because guys started getting more vested interest in like, Man, I don't want, even though I don't ever see this dude on the third shift, I'm going to make sure this is double checked and right so it doesn't mess him up in some way, even though I don't ever interact with this dude because 
I know he has two kids and one of his kids is about to be an Eagle Scout. Damn, I, I'll be damned if I want his arm to get shattered or something like that. And so, and it's funny when you talk about the books I'm reading now, that's the, the main thing in that General Caslin book is the three C's, um, uh, competency, character, and making sure you're caring. And so that, and that's the thing. I mean, these are the things that got him through Vietnam. These are the things that got him to lead everybody in Iraq. These are the things that get him to, you know, shift the culture at, at, at the, at the army Academy, because they were trying to figure out ways to beat Navy. They hadn't beaten Navy and, you know, trying to figure out different ways to get, you know, their coach Todd Munkin to, to figure out, cause you know, you got a certain talent pool you're going to pull from if you're in right. the academies. And so, I mean, all of those different things, um, it just, it, it, it's not surprising when you start to dig deeper a little bit. This is this is the common thread you see in a lot of successful businesses, families, all of those things. And even so, you know, the talent stuff, I mean, that usually takes care of itself because everybody has a modicum of talent, but like yes. you'll go that extra mile. And it's it makes sense that the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, I thought it was so appropriate when they started uh, towards the end championship Sunday when you saw, you know, everybody want to make the story about Tom Brady, rightfully so. He's a quarterback. We all love quarterbacks, you know. Yeah. That. Um, but Tom was like so uncomfortable. He was like, man, I want to give the trophy to these guys. You know, y'all want to, man, let's talk to these guys. And he kind of had to like shut it down and not be rude to the guy, but that just shows you like, he knew like, I'm just one part of this whole deal. Even though they're talking about me TV 12 all the time, like right. we really love being in this locker room together. And we got a nice group and we're in Florida and we got a nice boss, uh, Arians. And, and so, like you said, as long as they keep that kind of camaraderie, I think that team will be super successful. And, the other handful of teams, I think about the Kansas City Chiefs the same way, the way they're rallying around Andy Reid and all those different things. So it's it's uh, it's big things, man. Character is, is huge. And just really learning, leaning into that more as I get older, I start to see it more and more. It holds true for everything. You know, the interesting thing about Tom and everyone wants to do the Tom versus Bill thing. It's, it's almost like Tom is Bill's son. I don't think he would have had the success that he had last year or – through his whole career if it weren't for Bill and the systems that he laid out. But it seemed to me like Tom was ready to spread out and try a kinder, gentler version of what Bill does in New England with can we get the same result with a slightly different approach but take the juice from what Bill was doing, but let's let's make it a little bit more approachable and modernize it. And it seemed like with Bruce – and the coaching staff that it just worked so brilliantly, man, it was, it was, um, I mean, I, I heard somebody kind of break it down. Like the first 10 years of that 2000 dynasty of the Patriots was all bill laying the foundation, um, him being the main guy to keep everything going. And then from 10 to what it was now, it was all Tom doing it. But then that reached the threshold where, you know, bill was like, stop coaching the guys. I let me be the coach. You be the player. And I think that, <laughs> Obviously that took, but you know, it's hard to say that when you're Tom Brady, you've been there 20 years, you know, I can teach the guys a lot. And I think it was just the right time for him to go down to Tampa and they embraced that. Um, but also he was still held accountable because we heard the stories earlier on. Bruce Arians like, man, he played terrible. He threw those three picks. That's on him. And one, everybody was worried like, man, Tom's going to lose it. But Tom wants that accountability. They were He's through used it. to that. All right. They became stronger for it. And so, um, and now, and I think Tom is in a sweet spot where he feels good about teaching these guys. And I think it was very apropos because the whole off season was shut down and Tom was having those workouts. So who's better to, to be your on-field coach during the seven on sevens or whatever you're doing than Tom Brady. Cause he's going to, he's going to have those things detailed, even though y'all out in the park somewhere in like Tampa, you know, just throwing the ball around. <laughs> yeah. You're like, man, that was, that was six steps. That wasn't five and a half, man. And so it was kind of that perfect timing for him. So it will be interesting to see how long they're going to keep that rolling. And physically, can Tom keep that role for sure? Yeah, and that it's wild to watch him go. I mean, he's aging in reverse. It's just, it's unreal. What are your thoughts on that? Because what do you what do you think about? I mean, all this pliability, and you hear people yeah. talk about when they hit Tom, he's he's like softer when you, as opposed to when you hit some other guys. Like he just goes with it. Yeah, and I think everything in context, right? So when Tom's preaching this to some guys, I'm like. That would never work for an offensive or a defensive lineman or a linebacker because it, it, in a weird way, an offensive lineman's job as you're going, becoming a pro and you are a pro is to become less athletic. It's a weird concept because your job is to not be moved. So you don't want to be an athlete. I, when I was a really good athlete when I was young in the league, I kept getting hurt. 
because I move too much. It's like slow down and stop moving so much, become less athletic, and I got better, and I stopped getting hurt. And so when I think about Tom and the pliability and stuff, I'm like, that's great for your job, and it really works for a pitcher, but it doesn't really work for guys like us that are in there fighting and trying to move each other against their will. And, you know, it's a completely different beast. Now I do like now that I a hundred percent buy into pliability. It's like for life, it's for life. It's great for you. It's like long and supple and you want to feel good and you want to keep your spine moving and want to take care of your feet and joints as best you can. But you know, it's for the game. I'd, if we try, if we try to do that, we'd we get bent over. We would, it would be it'd be all bad. The turns like set the edge, and you know, like you couldn't. Nah, that's like that makes a. I never thought about it, especially from the offensive alignment standpoint. It's like, man, I never thought about it, but that makes sense because you always want to be between you and the defender. You know, I mean, if you're mm-hmm. squiggly, that gives a a little Von Miller guy a chance to like duck underneath you or do something like that, and you know, bodies all outside, and you get knocked around. That makes that, that makes a yeah. whole bunch of sense though when you say it. Yeah, it's like you just you you just you just want to stay in your frame. I always like described it like you're a cup of water and you don't want that water to spill out. If you're about three quarters full, five eighths full, you just don't want that water to spill out. It's like so don't tip too far. So just I'm, my job is to stay here. It's it's. Since you got golf, I think about golf like oh yeah, because golfy was man like I always. Like golf was always, I was like, man, you're more of an athlete than that. It was just like, but that makes sense, man. I mean, he's a vet in the game. And when he came out to you guys, he was definitely a vet. But um, I definitely, that's a mental picture I think of when I think about that. But that makes perfect sense. And to your point, man, like it's it's good to be loose as you get older. But football, man, it's all about, you know, tight movements, all of those different things. All right, Langston, we're running a little out on time because this has just been a super fun conversation. So I just got caught. I just, I I love this. It's been super fun. Give me a, do you have like a motto you guys live by at the house or? Oh man. Uh, any, anything you wake up every day and do, or, you know, something that has allowed you. For for me, kind of like my daily routine is, is try to, you know, incorporate a lot of meditation, a lot of movement. Um, I picked up some, some stuff and, it, and it's funny because I mean, I know this stuff, but application and knowledge is two different things. Right. So for me, um, like Joe, Joe Holly, uh, I think you were on his podcast, yeah. so, like just doing, instead of just doing full on workouts, micro movements. So I started adding more of those things in there throughout my day, there like, go. um, uh, kettlebell stuff, functionality movements. So, but I always just try to, you know, start the day off with, with gratitude, try not to dig into the phone right away. Try not to dig into any of that stuff right away. Try to at least set my day up where I have some space to, you know, get my mind right, get myself right, deal with whatever's going on. And that way I can be a better version to the world, be a better version to, you know, my wife, my daughter. Uh, I'm not walking around here, you know, acting like I got some stuff in my mind and they take it personally. Um, because I've seen, you know, that was fine when Langston was a football guy and he can go off for hours on the end. Yes, yeah, it, it worked. worked. It worked, but you know, I always think about the comedian, uh, I forget his name. He's like, man, you just can't, you got to do football stuff on the football field. You can't do football stuff outside. And so that attitude and mindset doesn't work here. And especially in a household where I'm the only guy. So, I mean, <laughs> you know, the girls would be yeah. up here. So um, definitely love to leave with a lot of that. Um, picking up different things from just, you know, podcasts, listening to you guys, just always taking the stance of just trying to learn some new stuff every day, try to build up on the skill. And that stuff just kind of keeps me kind of keeps me going, keeps, keeps those goals in front of me, kind of keeps me, you know, cause we can all get into a rut of just, oh damn, was it June or is it February? Because you know, <laughs> we, good lifestyle. we, some yeah, of, most of us probably don't have to work a nine to five. We can kind of choose how we want to make our work schedule. And so, you know, we can get into that monotony of just putting our head down and just dugging through life as opposed to, you know, just trying to take every day as a gift. And again, that's easier said than done. I had to do some work this morning wasn't in the best attitude, but for whatever reason, it's, it's done. And so recognizing that, using those tools, those are, I think, the things that, you know, kind of keep me going and, again, keep the household going. And Because ultimately, at the end of all of this, man, it's just about, you know, like they said in football, it's about the money and the memories. So, you know, you made some money, now it's about having these quality memories because that's really all yeah. you're going to have when this whole that's song and is over, man. So that's, that's it. I love the uh, the meditation, I, and I think about this a lot, too. It's And I'm, I'm getting into like much more of the softer arts, right? But I don't think 
and somebody commented on my post recently when I was like, people call me soft or whatever, and I don't care. It's It was a yoga teacher who wrote that her yoga teacher said, softer doesn't mean weaker. And you know what applied on the football field doesn't necessarily work all that well in real life, other than the work ethic and building relationships. And you talked about that earlier. So that's, that's something. And then I meditate every day as well. And I, and I think for us, but you know, just because we've been running our heads in the walls and we thought that, yeah. yeah. So, but to try to go back, (laughs) you know, everybody is working with emotional stuff that we suppressed. And, you know, sometimes some of us eat over it. Sometimes some of us work over some of the, some of us spend over it. So um, it's, it's goes back to some of that football stuff, just kind of trying to figure out and watch your tape good, bad, or indifferent, sitting down in there on a Monday morning. That was the worst thing ever. But once you went through that tape, good, bad, or indifferent, you felt better for it, even if it was the worst tape ever. You knew you had something, you can go back and, okay, I can do this. Let me work on my steps. And so I think applying some of that same stuff, and that's where meditation comes in, um, you know, changing up the meditation, you know, just walking meditation, different things. Yeah. And, you know, it all... It all, it, it all it all helps. And so again, the ability to kind of have some space between reaction uh, through your thoughts, uh, expectations, just all of that, and just kind of keeping that high level. I think about the the two different views we used to see in football. You see like the, the back level for the alignment, but then you see the yeah. all 22 level. And so trying to look more from the all 22 uh, as opposed to, you know, that, that kind of in your face, because we all know any problem, whatever it is, you know, it can feel like this phone right here on your face. And like, oh man, it's the biggest thing in the world. But until you get a little space from me, you can say, I can handle that a little bit. So um, that's the reason why meditation is so important. And I mean, it's funny, I used to use it so much just for like, uh, you know, try to visualize having a good game, but just, it's it's a great tool just to, just to relax, just to, you know, just to try to have a deep breath or whatever. And so I heard somebody say one time, if yoga's so good, don't ever leave it. You know, don't ever stop doing it. And it's, that's, that's something, uh, seeing other go. guys, seeing other guys do it, man, it's been it's been rewarding for real. Langston, this has been rewarding. Thank you. And I got, I got to tell you, I'm uh, I'm giving a speech next week. I'm meeting with a, like an insurance group, and I'm I'm going to do a little public speaking. And a couple of things you said, I may or may not give you credit for, but I'm I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm giving. That sound way better coming from you than it was. No way. I'm giving. I'm giving you. I'm. You know what? I'm giving you credit. Watch your tape, you, and you do. You got to watch your tape, and the best teams care the most about one another. And I 100. percent I 100 percent believe that. Let's do this again soon. That was great. Absolutely, man. I appreciate you guys. I appreciate all the work, and man, you uh, you inspire a whole bunch of us guys more than you know, man. So keep up that good work and uh, keep fighting a good fight, man, over there. Yeah, yeah. I do the same. I, I appreciate following you and your work you're doing. It's fantastic. I love it, man. I appreciate it, man. Hopefully it'll get warm out there soon, man. I know you're still out there in the cold in the, in the middle. <laughs> not, you, not used to this, Indiana. It's like it gets nice one day and then it's the next day it's 30. It's like uh, Prince Daniels is another former guy, PJ Daniels. He was a running back for the uh, Ravens and he does a whole bunch of meditation. And uh, he, was, he lives in San Diego. And I was like, man, what's the weather like? He's like, man, you know what the weather's like. <laughs> don't ask you don't have to ask perfect man it's perfect (laughs) right on buddy thing we can ever do man hit us up let us know cool same same back at you appreciate it nate all right right, buddy see ya